The 2012 Health Matters Conference led the Clinton Foundation to launch a year-long initiative to promote health and wellness through the work of individuals, communities, and corporations. The Clinton Health Matters Initiative will focus on improving health outcomes for people across the United States and on containing health care costs. Opening the conference, President Bill Clinton set the stage for the discussions to come. After I had my heart surgery, I had a much more personal interest in this for three reasons. One is the rising rate of childhood obesity in America. I could see a whole lot more people like me, and instead of conking out <clears throat> in their early to mid-50s of a heart attack, they were developing type 2 diabetes to children. This is a big deal. It's a big deal for America economically. We're spending more on health care than our competitors. We can't afford it. We're never going to get back to a full employment economy unless we change. How to bring about change, especially in historically disadvantaged communities, was a key topic. I think the country has a responsibility to create the conditions so that everybody has access to fresh fruits and vegetables, safe place to be physically active, and then we have to find a way to educate, motivate, and mobilize people to take advantage of those conditions. The solutions and the answers are there. So I'm asking for you and us, all of us, to shift our perspective from woe is me, woe is us, what are we going to do, the system's so broken, and say, you know what, forget about it. What am I going to do as an individual? Because this has got to be a grassroots movement. This has got to be reach one, teach one, where we support one another and we join together. And when we do that, I guarantee you, we will turn this around. Schools are seen as central to that turnaround effort. This now is becoming not only a real public health threat, but an existential question for who we are as a country and what we value. Schools did not create these problems. They should not be able, expected to solve these problems on their own, but school is such an important institution in the lives of our young people. We cannot solve these problems without schools playing an important role. And when you walk 18 Physical activity is, of course, another key ingredient. Health Matters 2012 heard from groundbreaking organizations working on ways to encourage healthier behavior in the workplace, with approaches ranging from the technological to the behavioral. We know that preaching is not working. We know people really know what it takes to be healthy. There's no, it's not rocket science. Eat less, exercise more, quit smoking. Yet, we don't do it. So the question is, where does innovation meet uh, the other ideas? And where does the new, new digital capability, where does the fun of social networking show up? and all of that, and how do you bring all that together to really sort of set up an environment where we can have a little more fun in health, because I don't know about you, but I don't think dealing with the healthcare system is all that much fun. So, we can do better. What was the funnest thing you did at school? Right, admit it, right, recess. So we said, why don't we bring recess back? And not just for kids, but for adults. And uh, somewhere along the way, if the funnest thing you did at school over the course of time got taken away from you, why? Don't let the man take away recess, bring it back. The Health Matters Conference provides a forum for pioneers and role models to share successes, challenges, and inspiration. One of the projects that I would say is, is my favorite and we've had a lot of success with is the Be Well book. This is a book that we uh, put out two years ago. It's a compilation of 15 stories that are told by 15 moms living in urban areas across the country. These moms uh, have very little resources, but have a lot of creativity and a huge passion and a huge commitment for getting their families on a healthier lifestyle track. Many people throughout the world or in, and throughout the different events that I do wonder why I chose diabetes, why I chose to take on this issue. There's a lot of other pressing issues and diseases that face us in this country, and it's because we can beat it. We can win. I'm very passionate about this. Um, you know, I'm taking the efforts I put on the golf course and my focus and my dedication. I want to impact the community that I live in first. I want to inspire these kids in the different schools that we need to be active in moderation. Rounding out Health Matters 2012, a town hall session with topics ranging from the fight against smoking to global agriculture. I've sat in on a gazillion medical meetings and a gazillion feel-good kumbaya sessions, but not with the energy of the brain power in this audience, a president we adore who we know can make things happen, people who representing all that's good about American medicine and industry and philanthropy. There is a chance here, a transformative moment. Talk about public-private partnerships. This is it. 
President Clinton put participants at this year's gathering on notice that he'll be looking for promises of action. Today, you will hear about the results. Good morning. I'm Kelvin Baggett, the Chief Medical Officer for Tenant Healthcare Corporation. We are pleased to serve as the presenting sponsor for the second annual Health Matters Conference. On behalf of our nearly 63,000 employees, physicians, clinicians, and staff across the country, and especially the two area hospitals, Des Desert Regional Medical Center, based in Palm Springs, and JFK Memorial Hospital in Indio, we are pleased to welcome you to the Coachella Valley. At Tenet, our mission is to improve the quality of life of every patient who enters our doors. Our hospitals and outpatient centers sit at the center of healthcare delivery within their communities. Through active community outreach and partnership, we work daily to improve the health of the individuals in our communities and to strengthen them. Therefore, working with the Clinton Health Matters Initiative is a natural partnership given our mutually shared goals. The inaugural Health Matters Conference in 2012 was held at Desert Regional Medical Center. Over the course of the past year, the Clinton Foundation has been actively involved in the Coachella Valley working on initiatives to improve health in the community and partnering to address the diverse needs that are represented there. You will hear more about that this afternoon from the Chief Executive Officer of Desert Regional Medical Center, Carolyn Caldwell. This year we are incredibly excited to rally our efforts around the convening initiative for the Health Matters Conference. As a company, we are committing ourselves to improving the nutritional options within our hospitals for our employees, our patients, and for those who will be visiting them. Our efforts will include comprehensive healthy, healthy eating action plans, and working with our contracted vendors and food suppliers to reduce the availability of sugary, high caloric options and to increase the number of healthy, nutritious fruits and vegetables within our hospitals. Through this commitment, we hope to inspire long-lasting changes in the health of thousands of individuals. And now I have the honor of introducing our 42nd President of the United States, Bill Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Baggett and Tenet for serving as our presenting sponsor for this second year running. I'm very excited about this. I'm grateful for Tenet's pledge to make their own hospital cafeterias and campuses healthier places. I want to thank all the people here from the Coachella Valley for welcoming us back and to kick off the Humana Tournament. Mike McAllister from Humana often describes this week as a serving of health with a side of golf. I'm not sure everybody here agrees with that order of priorities, but I'll take everyone's participation however we can get it. I'm grateful to Humana and to the PGA Tour for their continued partnership on this great event, and uh, I've had, just in the last couple of weeks, conversations with last year's winner, Mark Wilson, and with Phil Mickelson and their wives about how they can become more active in doing what they believe 
in which is the purpose of this conference. Today we will celebrate individuals, communities, NGOs, and companies that have made pledges to contribute to the health and wellness of others. This is important not only because these pledges will improve the quality of life for the individuals involved, but because poor health has the potential to cripple our economic stability and our sense of common bond as a society. In the United States, we spend well over 17% of our GDP on health care. The numbers vary depending on the measurement and who's measuring between 17.4 and 17.8%. But since no other wealthy country spends more than 12 and no other country of a population of 60 million or more spends more than 11 8 that's somewhere between 850 billion and a trillion dollars every single year that we spend so far to ensure less than 100% of our people and to care for them, those that are uninsured in an erratic and delayed way that we wouldn't spend if we had any other country's system and habits. We know that some of these costs, for example, are the direct result of our excess rates of obesity and type 2 diabetes and their attendant consequences. About 70% of adults have already developed a preventable chronic disease, which contributes to rising health care costs and reduced workplace productivity and premature death. And according to an article which I saw in USA Today about 10 days before November's election, so it didn't, everybody was all politics all the time, and it, I'm sad to say, didn't get much notice. But these economists had done a study of analyzing why wages had been flat for a decade and median family income was lower after inflation before the financial crash than it was the day I left office, seems like a century ago, 12 years ago now. And they concluded that one of the biggest reasons was that employers who really wanted to give pay raises to their employees, even in challenging times, could not do it because they were spending all their money on health care premiums. So this is really an important thing for us to deal with. Researchers from Columbia University estimate that costs related to preventable diseases will r rise by 48 to $66 billion a year between now and 2030 if the current trends continue. Yesterday, I was at a conference in Laguna de Gale hosted by Joe Chiani and Massimo, who's one of our partners here, amassing experts from all over America and all over the world to figure out how to reduce preventable deaths in America to zero by 2020. It's a laudable goal, and they had a lot of people interested in it, but I'm sure you'll hear more about that while we're here, too. We cannot ignore the link between health and the economy, and it runs both ways. Last September, there was a truly heartbreaking story in the New York Times. Again, I, I was shocked. It achieved almost no national recognition because I think it was on the front page, but it was presented as a public health story and not a political social story, documenting that America's life expectancy continues to rise for all groups except one, non-college educated white Americans. Non, I mean non-high school educated, people who drop out of high school. Hispanic high school dropouts now have a higher life expectancy than Americans of European descent who dropped out of high school. African-American high school dropouts for the first time have a life expectancy equal to high school dropouts of European descent. Unfortunately, it's because the latter have been dropping, not because the former have been rising. And if you read the story, it was unbelievable. It said that from 1990 to 2008, 
life expectancy among high school dropouts who were white women had dropped five years. To give you some measure of comparison, the only place where anything like that has happened in the world is after the Soviet Union collapsed and the healthcare system went down with it. When they went through total economic distress, there was a seven year drop in life expectancy there from 66 to 59 for men and slightly higher for women. And, interested, and the men's life expectancy had dropped three years. And they said there were several reasons for this. The rise in smoking, rise in obesity rates and the attendant consequences, the rise in drug abuse deaths, mostly prescription drug abuses, and the lack of health insurance. And they said that the reason the women's life expectancy had dropped more than the men is that women's smoking rates went up way higher than the men's did. Now, I believe that it's another way of saying that a lot of the, these people were dying young of a broken heart because of the devastating effects of the economic trends of the last dozen years or so on them. But we have to face the fact that this is happening and that this is a part of what we need to do. These people are part of our country. They can be making massive contributions to our economy. They are parents. Their children need them to live long and healthy lives. This work we can do, whether we're doctors and nurses and medical researchers or health care providers or just people, is very, very important. And I bring this out because most of the other good news is, and most of the other news is good. There's a lot of evidence that the childhood obesity rates have leveled off and are dropping in many places. We've got uh, a, a new report since we were here last year that the agreement we made with the soft drink manufacturers to reduce the caloric content in schools of drinks served both in the cafeterias and in the school <coughs> uh, vending machines, that those calories have dropped by 90% in more than 90% of the schools in America, purely by agreement. There are more than 30 million more children eating healthier meals, more nutritious meals at more affordable prices in small towns and rural areas where they used to have to pay more per meal for these things that were these practices were instituted before the new USDA guidelines came in. And I say that to encourage all of you to believe that we don't need a, a government solution to all these things. We, it's good to have the right government policies, but there are things that we can do together that we can do that will make a difference. So I'm encouraged by that. Um, I wanted to also, just mention a couple of other things. Last year, I asked everybody in this audience to get involved in some way and actually make commitments to do what we do every year at the Clinton Global Initiative. Today, there will be pledges that amount in value to $100 million to improve health and wellness that will help more than 25 million people all across America. I'm grateful to our sponsors, GE, Massimo, Verizon, Sandolfi, Catalyst Group Global, Price Waterhouse Cooper, the Greenbaum Foundation, the Berger Foundation, the Owen Foundation, the California Endowment for stepping up. I'm grateful to many of you in this audience, including my longtime friend, Vin Gupta, for the commitments that you will make. But I want to take special note of one. I'd like to ask Carter Kostler to stand up. Carter, where are you? Stand up. There he is, see him? He is 14 years old. He'll be able to support us all in our old age. You listen to this. He saw a problem and solved it. The problem was that he and his mom wanted to stay more hydrated and found they drank more water if they infused it with fruit. As they traveled around town, they couldn't carry the pitcher with a strainer around. So he figured out a design for a carry-around size 
fruit-infused water bottle, and he manufactured it. He's also decided to donate a portion of his earnings to the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, our foundation's childhood obesity initiative. You will all receive his invention in your gift bags today. I urge you to use it, and thank goodness there are 14-year-olds who can think like this and are doing something to give us a better future. Thank you. Today, you'll hear more stories from speakers about how they, like Carter, are planning to make a difference. I hope you'll get involved because we have to turn the tide in America. And as a result of what so many of you said to me last year, our foundation has now started a new year-round initiative called the Health Matters Initiative, which will bring together individuals, communities, and companies and NGOs and philanthropists to make health and wellness a priority to improve the quality of health for people across America who are not covered by our Childhood Obesity Initiative. We want people to make healthy changes and to try to reform systems that affect people's health. We need your help to make this a success. It will take everyone in the room and then some to really turn the tide, but we can do it. You'll hear today from people who, in all sorts of interesting ways, have used their ingenuity and resources, large and small, to be part of the solution. So thanks for being with us today, and I look forward to having a great day. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Don Berwick. Thank you all. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be with you, and I'm, I'm very grateful to the Clinton Foundation for their leadership here. In 1971, I was a medical student, and Jeff was uh, eight years old. Jeff was my patient. He did not make it to nine. He had acute leukemia. Uh, he was the first child that I ever sat with as he died, and I think of Jeff very often. Uh, today, Jeff would live. The full, uh, gleaming majesty of modern med technolo medical technology would uh, come to his side, chemotherapy, radiation, bone marrow transplant, and he would someday see his grandchildren. It would be a miracle. When I was a young doctor in training, every kid I saw with leukemia died. Now, they almost all live. We can transplant livers and lungs. We can control AIDS. We can fix congenital heart defects that would have killed their victims just a few decades ago. Bravo. We need these miracles, and we should never, ever stop pursuing them. But let's look at some numbers. This year, 2,000 kids will have leukemia. Every single one of them deserves a miracle, no doubt. But 215,000 kids will have diabetes. 7.1 million kids will have asthma. 12.5 million kids, 15% of all kids in our country, will be obese. Where are their miracles? For every person, kid or adult, who can benefit today from a heart transplant or miraculous drugs or surgery and should, there are hundreds, there are actually thousands, who live every day with their chronic illnesses. They need help that is less charismatic, is less gleaming, in order to lead their full lives, to see their grandkids graduate, to do their woodworking, to cheer their football team. Uh, even though they will have and, and will always have chronic heart failure and chronic lung disease and diabetes and bipolar disorder and arthritis, they need teams. They need teams of doctors and nurses to coordinate their tests and their medicines. They need communities, community supports to help them get around and stay safe and need education so that they and their families can take better and better care of themselves. Hospitals actually cannot help them thrive. Communities can. When that goes well, what can happen is absolutely amazing. One of my favorite examples is uh, the so-called NUCA system of primary and community care uh, 
for Alaska Natives. It's run by the Native American Corporation in Anchorage, Alaska, South Central Foundation. NUCA is team-based, community-focused, prevention-focused, education-focused healthcare. NUCA uses every resource patients and families can bring to their own health and care. NUCA thinks that the best hospital bed is an empty one. Many Alaska Natives in the Anchorage Bowl have very high levels of chronic illness and social stress, but NUCA in six years cut hospital days by 53%, emergency department visits by 50%, specialty consultations by 65%. They even cut primary care visits by 20%, and they have the best healthcare quality scores you can find and the highest patient and staff satisfaction they have ever had. NUCA builds bridges. It builds bridges to where the need is. Chronic illness care, prevention, spiritual health, family health, behavioral health, teams, home. It offers love, it offers respect to people who thought that they were unlovable and invisible. I could give you dozens of examples like NUCA. They are gems. They're in pockets all over America. They're all over the world. And by the way, these gems hold the best possible solution to the immense problem of health care costs in America that President Clinton referred to. The best possible solution is improve the care, improve the health. Just do the math. If NUCA can cut hospital use by 53% while getting better outcomes, what could we do for America's health care costs if we could get, say, even a fraction of that success into every community in, in our nation, just by focusing on communities and on health, like NUCA does. Healthcare costs could be solved. They could be solved. And we would have all the money left over that we would ever need for the miracles of technology to save kids like Jeff. But that's not the whole story. We've got two big problems en route to NUCA, and I want to describe them to you. Here's the first problem. Remember the NUCA results? 53% fewer hospital days, 65% less use of specialists, not because these are rationed, but because people don't need them. Well, just imagine a bright young innovator in an American hospital runs breathless into the chief executive's office or the boardroom, and she says excited, guess what, guys? I know how to cut our admissions by 53% and our referrals by 65%. That will not be a long conversation. It's not that the executives or the board don't want people to healthy. Of course they want people to be healthy. Uh, but they have been conditioned. They've been conditioned by dec over decades by a broken, volume-based uh, healthcare payment system to maintain business plans that depend on doing more, not less. For them, even though they know in their hearts that it's not so, a full bed is, empty than, is better than an empty bed, and a busy machine is better than an idle one. Let me be clear, these are not bad people. They are just hitting the pitch that we throw them. If the pitch says, do more, they will do more. If the pitch changes and says, keep us healthy, help us thrive, well, they'll hit that pitch too. They will hit it. We're, we're very slowly changing the pitch right now with new emphases on payment for chronic care, coordination, outcomes. But don't make any mistake about it. It took a century to build the edifice of technical miracles, and a lot of the $2.6 trillion that we're spending on healthcare today is invested there. This is very hard to change, and it's gonna take guts. And there's a second problem. It's about the causes of health, the causes of health itself. Why do we get sick in the first place? Why are heart attacks, our strokes, our cancers, our depression? Why are injuries in our lost years? To understand the answer, you have to remember only one number, and here's the number. Four. Here's that math. If you assign, say, 10 points to variation in health, the reasons we get sick, science says that our genes get five points. Someday we're going to learn how to change those risks, but right now our genes are just the cards we're dealt. But what about the other 50%, the other half, the risks we can control? Well, healthcare gets some credit for making us and keeping us healthy. Of 10 points, healthcare gets one. 10% of our health today is related to something about the care that we get or we don't get. The whole rest, four out of 10 points, 40% of our health, it depends on choices. What we eat, how much we walk, the risks we take with substance abuse or unprotected sex, the guns and violence in our streets, the pollutants in our air, the seat belts and the bike helmets that we use or don't use, four points for fresh air and bicycle lanes and good parks and help to young mothers, four points for love in our lives. 
and remembering that we are all in this together. Four points for the quality of our neighborhoods and the knowledge we have and the knowledge we use to take care of our health and to respect our neighbor's health. Four times more health in our own hands than in all the awesome hospitals and the chrome surgery suites and the blue pills and the red sirens. And that is very good news because that means that we can, if we choose, take living long and living well largely into our own hands. But it is tough news because it means we cannot make an appointment with a healer. We cannot buy the miracle. We are the healer. We are the miracle. And that responsibility is one that we may not welcome. I applaud the Clinton Foundation for taking on the mission of healthy communities. It is the, the best path by far to thriving. But make no mistake, this is a mission of change, of profound change in beliefs, uh, change in economics, change in business plans, change in the labor force, change in our use of capital, change in our deeply held myths about how to get healthy and stay healthy. There are two new bridges to build. One, to care for chronic illness, and beyond that, another new bridge to new communities where health is the point. What we get for the trouble is this. We will get better care, we will get better health, and we will get lower costs through improvement. We will thrive. And that, as far as I am concerned, is what we wanted in the first place. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Bill Clinton and Dr. Nancy Snyderman. Welcome everyone to the second annual uh, Health Matters and um, welcome Mr. President to your own forum. <laughs> We've got to stop meeting like this. We should have full disclosure here. Uh, no, we shouldn't. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've been friends for 30 years. 30 years. We go way, way, way back to when he was making $32,000 a year as the governor, right? Or was, am I overestimating your income then? I think it was 30, but anyway, oh. whatever it was. <laughs> we go way back, and as some of you know, not only are we old friends, but um, the Secretary of State, when she used to practice law, um, helped me adopt my now 26-year-old, so I have a, and now my colleague in NBC News is Chelsea, so things go all full circle. So rumor has it that Hillary Clinton's husband was spotted at the Golden Globes. Yeah, it's not my forum, is it? <laughs> I thought you did pretty darn well, the navy blue sincere suit talking about the president, and uh, I must say, standing ovation. Well, Steven Spielberg let me write my own script, which I couldn't believe. <laughs> Here's what happened. I was, um, this is important for what's going on today, actually. I've, he and I have been friends for 20 years, and on a couple of occasions, he's been nice enough to send me a script of a movie with some relevance to things I know and asked me to read it. So he called me and said he wanted to make this movie about Lincoln's last weeks and the passage of the 13th Amendment, which is a story nearly no American knows. And he said, would you read the script? So I did, and I made some suggestions for how I should change it, and I called him. And then he sent me a second copy, did then he, he sent me a third you? copy. And so he said, you had something to do with making this movie because I really wanted just to tell the story about how this man had no death wish and how Lincoln the man was way more interesting than Lincoln the legend and how he practiced really tough, gritty politics, trying to achieve compromises on small things so he could do one big thing in slavery, and why he was determined to do it with the Congress that he had instead of a better one that was coming back. And it, it, this movie explains all that. So he asked me to introduce it and, and to explain what the historic importance was, so I agreed to do it. And you did a, you did a great job, and you did it with jocularity. But when you read that script, were there things that you thought didn't ring true to, Clint, to Lincoln the man? No. You liked it? I liked it. I thought, well, I thought the movie should be a movie for general audiences. And it was very carefully done based on 
diaries like of these members of Congress that made all these deals and the letters they wrote and the letters that, and the records that Lincoln's fabulous two secretaries, John Hay, who later became Secretary of State, and John Nicolay left. But like I thought some of the language was a little too earthy if you wanted nine-year-olds to go to the movie. And then there was, uh, I thought, I recommended that they end it the way they did. That, you know, it's hard to figure out how to end a story like that because you want to end it up, not down, but it ends with Lincoln being killed. So they did it with Lincoln's second inaugural, which is by a long stretch the finest inaugural address ever driven, given by any president, and the second shortest. George Washington's uh, second inaugural was the shortest. He just basically went and said, thanks for the job, let's go back to work. <laughs> it was 90 seconds. But uh, and mine was the third shortest, my first inaugural. You and I last year spoke about what you've learned in your own life with your cardiac disease, how you've changed how you eat and you exercise, that you have now led and through the foundation by example. You've really changed totally how you approach sleep to some extent, eating, exercise, et cetera. So I have a question to ask of you. When you have moments with the Secretary of State and pillow osmosis can happen, do you ever tell her to slow down? No, because, <laughs> but she will when she gets out. But you know, she... Because you know we all worry. Yeah, but she, what you all need to know is that when she was in Washington, the morning she was in Washington, she worked out every morning at 6.30 with a trainer. And she swam five days a week when it was possible. And she has, is much more disciplined in sleeping than I am. She can sleep on an airplane all the time. Every time she got on an airplane, she slept. So that's how she kept up this incredibly grueling schedule. And what happened to her had nothing to do with her exhaustion. She got a terrible virus. And it was one of the manifestations of it was prolonged retching, even when there was no biological reason to do it and she fainted and hit her head and got a concussion but she is going to take a long rest because she's been hitting it for 20 years so I wanted to just take a few months before she does anything. Well you had a bumpy end to 2012 and we're looking forward to 2013 being a little more um, mundane but let's talk I could a be a private duty nurse however yeah. if any of you need one. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm virtually certified. But no one moves on your watch. Yeah. <laughs> You have been a big believer in public-private partnerships since I knew you back in Arkansas. You maintained that through your presidency, and you're living it now. Where do you think we as Americans go wrong in expecting government to fix things? And what, and underscore for me, again, how you think the future in healthcare is going to change with these partnerships? Well, first of all, I think the great thing about the modern world and the Internet is both an instrument and a metaphor for it is that everybody's connected and everything's connected. And it's like I said, this, this, uh, if you look at this precipitous drop in life expectancy among white high school dropouts, there are clear m m medical reasons for it, uh, but there are also psychological and social reasons that have reinforced it. So, and if you look at what's working, where the places that are growing economically in America, the places that are doing best around the world, you have these creative networks of cooperation. So there are some things that government's really good at, and they have to do that. There are some things that private sectors and NGOs are better at, and they have to do that. And then they have to figure out how to keep changing. And we're, going to, we're moving into an era when the only way you can create enough jobs for people, for example, and generate enough wealth to have decently rising wages is if you have creative networks of cooperation. I think the same thing is true with this health challenge. And that's the only thing that works. It works everywhere in the world. And by the way, there's a lot of research on groupthink which proves that. For example, I saw yet another study, the third I've read about in the last decade, last week that said, if you put a group of people with average IQs together and you ask them to work on a problem for a year and you give the same problem to a genius, over the long run, the group of average intelligence with the greater numbers working together will do better than one genius acting alone. You and I um, last year spent time in a school that has totally revamped its cafeteria and put exercise back in schools. 
I've told you several times that nothing makes me bluer and more of a pessimist than looking at the obesity incidents in our kids. Give me one reason why you think I should be more optimistic. Because the rates have leveled off, and in some places they've dropped. I mean, in, in a few places where they measure body mass index, the kids' body mass index has gone down. The real problem is like when all these new guidelines came out from the USDA, a lot of these kids' taste buds are attuned to different food, and they didn't like it. I've been in schools, even one of our highest rated schools in the Clinton, the Childhood Obesity Initiative. <laughs> one of our highest rated schools, I was there one day, and people were exercising in the gym. They do, it's in New Jersey, so they had the gym open at lunch hour, and ordinary kids were in there exercising, not just the athletes. But the kids were still, a lot of them were walking past the vegetables. And we just have to be patient with that. It has to become a positive thing. One of the things we know about human psychology is you can't get group change very much with negative strategies. This bad thing's going to happen to you. You have to make it a positive thing, a good thing. And there has to be a lot of peer changes. But I think you should be optimistic because the overall numbers are getting better in an area where there's been a concentrated effort for about six years now. And as we increasingly look in a global way, and you do that with the CGI, but so many corporations have a global stake in not only fending off starvation, but the obesity issues in China and India and places where we're turning increasingly for technology. What's the responsibility as, uh, of us in this country to have more of a global reach? Well, I think, first of all, more of our companies are involved globally and more of our citizens are involved through non-governmental organizations, even if it's just through internet giving, modest amount of money. But I think that a lot of these companies will continue to lead the way. Uh, there's an interesting book, if you want to be optimistic about the future, by Stephen Johnson, who's a, a great science writer. It's called Future Perfect. And his first two books, one's called The Ghost Map, which is about how the cholera epidemic was solved in London in the 1700s, and one's about, called uh, The Invention of Air, which is about the discovery of oxygen. But he's turned his attention to the modern world. And this book points out that companies that branded themselves as being good for their employees and their health and their wellness and their children's aspirations, good for their customers and good for their communities, over the last up and down crazy 12 years we've been through, had a rate of return overall to their shareholders that was almost 10 times as much as companies that had only a quarterly focus on quarterly returns and cared about their shareholders here and their employees and their families and their communities and their customers here. So I think more and more companies are going to adopt this model within the United States and beyond our borders. But there are huge global health problems that American companies and American citizens should help to address. And interestingly, just as my experience, that people who get involved in trying to do that just in a little way or also tend to be more healthier, uh, healthier at home and to influence their peers. Don Bergwick uh, spoke for a second about the human genome. Would you ever have your human genome mapped out and make it public? Oh, God, yes. I'd love to do that. I'm, I'm going to do I'm that. I'm convinced I'm related to Attila the Hun or something. <laughs> well, there, that's and it. everybody in Asia is related to Genghis Khan. He had so many kids. So uh, I'd be fascinated. Excellent, excellent. Um, Rush Limbaugh and I are probably 25th cousins. You know, I, you know. <laughs> you know, you never know. <laughs> what are you reading now? Well, I just finished this. I'm reading a new book by this guy, Stephen Johnson, on the history of innovation and what really makes it work. And um, I'm looking forward to getting, you know, through that. And uh, I'm reading Nate Silver's wonderful book. You know, he's the guy that did all the political predictions. But he started out trying to figure out how to predict which college and minor league baseball players could make it in the major leagues. So I'm reading that book. It's just fascinating about the challenges of prediction and how much is 
statistics and how much is instinct and what do you look for. So those are the two things I'm reading now. And two final things before. One, do you read more than one book at a time? Sometimes. I started out the year when, when Hillary was convalescing, I read nothing but Cheap Thrills Mysteries. <laughs> I read Janet Ivanovich's new book, which is just hilarious. And um, I read a book, one funny book that came out several years ago, like 2005 or six, by Jonas Johnson, a Swedish writer, called The Hundred-Year-Old Man Who Jumped Out of a Window and Disappeared. It is one of the most interesting books I've ever seen. I can't figure out how you could afford to make a movie out of it because of his crazy life, but it is hilarious. I recommend it to you if you need something to get your spirits up. As the Secretary of State takes some time and gets better and looks at this transition to a new Secretary of State and you guys redefine your new normal, whatever that is in the Clinton family, and in 2016 is ling simmering out there and people keep nudging you guys, what would you advise Hillary as the reason to run and what would you say to her she should be cautious about if she were to decide? Well, <clears throat> First of all, I don't think her health is an issue. But when Hillary had to go back to the hospital, as has been described, to take her blood thinners so we could monitor that because the concussion wasn't totally gone, it was the second time in her adult life, in her childhood life, in her whole life, that she'd ever spent the night in the hospital. And the first night she spent the night in the hospital, Chelsea was born. And Chelsea was born nearly at midnight. I'm convinced if Chelsea had been born in, in the morning, Hillary would have insisted on going home. <laughs> she's, she's always been very, very healthy. And she has very low blood pressure, very low standing heartbeat. I tell her that, you know, she's still got time to have three more husbands after me. <laughs> so I think she'll live to be 120. And I, I always know that she's thinking about that. Whenever I am stubborn about something, in her constant quest at my self-improvement. <laughs> she refers to me as her first husband. Because <laughs> I told her once she's gonna live to be 120 and have time for plenty more. But anyway, <laughs> my advice is that she should rest up and decide what she wants to do with the rest of her life. And whether she thinks this is the right thing for her and for America and for the world. It's the right thing, and, and if she does, she should do it, and if she doesn't, she shouldn't. Look, we've had a great life. You reach a certain point in life when every day is a gift, so your calculations are not the same as they were 20 years ago. I'm much more tolerant of a lot of things that drive people nuts about Washington because I remember what it was like to be 35 or 40 years old and still in the grip of your ambition. It's just different when you reach this. She's the gift, most gifted public servant I've ever known. And whatever she decides to do is fine with me. Are you or are she consumed with the third third of your lives? Yeah, it's the only one we got. <laughs> <laughs> sure we are. You bet we are. I think, you know, it, that's... I, we both always tried not to live in the past, you know. And I'm a Southerner who grew up on... William Faulkner and Thomas Wolfe, it's hard for me not to be obsessed with the past. But I try to do it in a positive way. I mean, I'm grateful for the life I've had and grateful for the friends I've had. And I learned a long time ago that you someday subconsciously you measure your life by the people you really cared about who aren't around anymore. And the older you get, the more that's true. But almost everybody who works and our foundation is way younger than I am. And I try to spend a lot of time with younger people and keep my ideas fresh and my mind going. And so, and we're both like that. And so, yes, we're obsessed with it, but I think it's a positive obsession. We just want to make the most out of every day. Well, thank you for this conference. Thanks for what the Clinton Foundation's doing. And uh, it's always a treat to see you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you all. Everyone. Clinton, everyone. President Clinton, thank you. We're going to do some chair rearranging. Um,
while we set up for the next panel. I think Chelsea saved a spot for you, Mr. Clinton. This, um, this conference is astonishing by mere fact of what it accomplished last year in sort of setting the ball forward. As President Clinton said, um, we can't do it without a confluence of NGOs, private um, corporations, public corporations, and government. But if anybody knows uh, Bill Clinton, there are two things that he asks of everyone. One, that people share their toys. And two, that when you leave the room, you have an assignment for the following year. And last year when we spoke at lunch, that was his mantra, that everyone has something to do and report back. Because if we're going to kick the can down the road, everybody has to have an assignment. I'm going to call out Chelsea Clinton for a second, because Chelsea and I have known each other for a gazillion years. And she and I have spoken over the years about the earnestness of how to live a full life. And um, her grandmother, Dorothy Rodham, was one of those people who thought that everyone had a moral responsibility to make the world a little better. And there's a lot of Dorothy in Chelsea. So as Chelsea now tells her stories at NBC News and um, r runs forums like this, I think it's a fair shot to say that we see a generational handoff of trying to make the world smarter, better, and more cohesive. The fact that this conference is now in its second year and is so robust is a real tribute to the president and to the extraordinary legions of people he has behind this stage who have helped to pull this off. So with no further ado, I'd like to pull up my panel members. I'm not sure in what order everyone's sitting. But let's take it from here. Dr. Kelvin Baggett, who we saw earlier from um, CMO at Tenet Healthcare. Don Berwick, um, pediatrician, friend of mine who started the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and physician. Peter Tippett, who uh, is brains behind technology at Verizon. And Michael McAllister, former CEO at Humana. And a friend of mine from GE, uh, Sue Siegel, who runs Healthy Imagination. Welcome to all of you. Nice to see you again, Peter. So in a nutshell, and I really mean in a nutshell, because we can't transform healthcare and make the world better if it's just dollars put in a kitty, I would like each of you to explain the pledge you've made to this August group and to the Clinton Foundation and why you're bringing what you're bringing to the table. Okay, I want to start with you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so as I said in the, uh, the welcome, we're a presenting sponsor for this, and, and part of the reason is because our mission is to improve the quality of life of patients who enter our doors. And this gives us an opportunity to really partner and to build something that's, that's bigger than ourselves. And the way we're going to do that is through collaboration with organizations like this, as well as others, who are committed to looking at things differently and who are committed to having a different outcome that moves us beyond... Um, where we are today and improving the status of the health of the nation. Don? Don? Um, well, I'll do anything the Clinton Foundation <laughs> asked me to do. Um, I've been having the wonderful year traveling all over the United States watching communities get activated. I think people are starting to realize uh, what's possible and that it's in their own hands. And I'm, activating communities is the biggest, the biggest job this country has right now. It's what do you mean by are. activating communities? Well, don't wait for Washington. Don't wait for some higher authority to come in and tell you what to do. The knowledge is there, and you will find in your communities people who understand exactly what has to happen to help overcome some of these, these plagues that are overtaking our, our nation right now and that we can stop. Obesity, violence, uh, the, 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 the precursors of diabetes, the things that we really can do something about. It's local action that's going to make the difference now. Michael, you sit in sort of a sweet spot of looking how health care and insurance industry is now a very, very interesting nexus. Yes. Um, the commitment we've made as part of the program is we're, um, well, for the very first time, and it started a couple of weeks ago, January 1st, we are uh, rolling out a platform to 750,000 seniors around, it's called Humana Vitality, but it's the concept of risks or reward programs and sort of stealing from the rest of the economy around getting behavior modification. Because we've talked about the system and we, we don't have to be, beat that to death. We, we know we have system issues. We really don't have much of a healthcare system. We have healthcare sprinkled all around. 
So uh, we're, we're going to have to work on that system, and we're committed to doing that, and we believe that integrating healthcare, as Don talked about earlier, is a, is a critical answer to that. But you also have to get people to change. And so the commitment we're, we're making here uh, this week is to take this program to 750,000 people, prove its worth, and then launch it from there. Sue, as part of GE, you've done some extraordinary work showing that communities can, in fact, change. What is GE bringing to the table? And tell me a little bit about the Cincinnati Project. Sure. So Jeff Immelt, our chairman and CEO in 2009, decided that we had to take health care into our own hands. We couldn't wait for anybody, and you were saying this, Don, to tell us what to do or to have any one sort of structure legislation or anything else to make things happen. So we embarked with a $6 billion commitment through Healthy Imagination to provide better health for more people. One of the activities around that, which essentially um, our chairman said, was go and show that this can not only happen internally at GE, but essentially can also happen externally in communities. Go pick communities that we can collaborate with in private uh, public partnerships to make things happen in healthcare, and we did it in Cincinnati. And since then, we had 10 large self-insured employers join up in this initiative. We've had 19 hospitals and different healthcare services organizations. We had the, of course, the appropriate um, political and uh, country uh, company types of individuals come in terms of policy making. And what we've been able to do with this kind of collaborative over the last two years is quite remarkable. There's now, based on a report, that claimed that, for example, there's been $200 million in savings alone as it relates to emergency room cost. In addition to that, there is surveys where it shows because of the coordinated care that has now been put into place in Cincinnati, that in fact the rate of satisfaction of consumers, patients, are in fact increasing rapidly. And last but not the least, the pricing transparency and transparency that they've put throughout the system being very wired is remarkable. And we'd like to repeat that with the Clinton Foundation and our partners on stage here to do it nationally. Peter, I, it's interesting watching everyone sort of nod their head as Sue spoken. You and I have had conversations in the past that Verizon, while many people think about it as a phone and broadband company, increasingly sees itself as a healthcare company. Yeah, Verizon has a commitment to something we call shared success. And uh, this is um, going beyond, you know, sending vaccines to Bangladesh and getting a video uh, of, of the episode so you can claim you did some good to society, but rather by really engaging in products and services and changing society for the good, and at the same time being a part of that. Uh, and that's a, that's a foundational principle at, at Verizon. One of the things that we think we can do beyond communication is do things that will facilitate this he healthcare transformation that we all see around us. We know there's an electronic component to it. We know there's a mobile component to it. We know that those things have engaged to, pr to reduce costs, improve quality, and all other aspects of our life. Why can't we do the things to remove the barriers there? that can help accelerate the whole ecosystem. Among them, regulatory uh, you know, barriers, you know, making things easier to be compliant with HIPAA and whatnot, making services that are available to everyone to use to, to, to engage. Um, so we're, we're really all in on healthcare. We're all in on really helping drive the change. I want to remind everyone that we'll take questions by Twitter. If you raise your hand, if you have a question for anyone on the panel, please just raise your hand and I will see you through the lights and we'll get your question answered. And for you guys now, thank you for your opening statements and now a, re a real conversation. I'd like to sort of start with the elderly and move back. There's a trend now, and I happen to think it's the smart, smart, smart way to go, of letting people age in place, not putting people in hospitals, not necessarily putting people in nursing homes, but uh, making the home a safe, smart, wired home so that people can live a robust life and frankly slide out at home plate. Would you guys address that and in no particular order? Michael. Let me start. We, uh, we have millions of seniors that are our customers um, and we have a program called Medicare Advantage um, and essentially what that says is we have a holistic responsibility for everything that happens with these folks. And if you look at what happens in the old Medicare program, people are readmitted to the hospital one out of five within 30 days after being discharged. And what we have learned and what we're answering uh, with coordinated efforts is that it's often the social setting and their support mechanisms, not their health status, that has them bouncing in and out of the system. 
And so we built something called Humana Cares, which is a big integrated approach, both on-site, telephonic, and, and we have everything from transportation to food to whatever it takes. And we actually go to homes and assess the status of that. And it's incredible what's, what's happened. The uh, hospital admission rates in that population are down a third. The readmission rates have been reduced by 26%. Uh, and it's all about having that sort of uh, ability to get them to the right place at the right time. Make sure they take their medications. Make sure they understand the doctor's orders. Make sure they get back to the doctor in a timely way. All of those things. It's really a lot of blocking and tackling, but the, the impact is huge. And now we have new emerging technologies as well where we're going to be able to start monitoring people in homes. And I can easily see a day where we're going to see a productivity gain that will be mind-boggling in scale relative to being able to keep up with these, these people in their homes because they do want to stay there. I mean, other than the Orwellian fear of someone's always watching, there is a way to monitor bed, pills, refrigerators. You know, one of the interesting uh, things is kids don't live with parents anymore, right? We get all excited about the social network phenomena, but the social network phenomena boils, I mean, for, for the elderly, boils down to the real social network, not the virtual one that my, my mother and sister and brother and neighbors and, and so on. So one of the, one of the sort, of, sort of simplistic things you can do is enable the kid that's two states away to figure out what's going on at home. I'm, I've, I've got just one example of that. I'm wearing a watch that I call a Dick Tracy watch. It's one of the things our, our uh, Hughes uh, Telematics Division uh, made. Um, and you, know, you push the button and you can talk to somebody. But it also has electronics, uh, you know, accelerometers, and an ability to determine a fall, and a, you know, ability to determine whether you're walking well, and so on. So imagine if you give permission that your family is good to know what you're up to. It's not everybody, it's your family. Maybe it's not the kid you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> only, only your three favorite kids, right? But, but imagine that, that uh, you can, the, the, your kid will know that you've been up and around just because your motion uh, accelerometer can help record the, the, the movement. If you're a wandering, uh, you know, uh, uh, Alzheimer's person in early stages, knowing, uh, you know, where you've gone with GPS tracking and so on, these sound onerous, but when you think of them in the, in the context of your local, of your actual physical social network, they make perfect sense. John? Yeah, uh, two things. Uh, nothing excited me more. I, I love the running CMS. Uh, it was a great job. But nothing was better than, the, than this trend you're talking about. There's a lot in the Affordable Care Act and in prior policy that really will help communities that want to do it get people out of nursing homes, out of homes for developmentally disabled people, out of mental health uh, inpatient facilities, and back to their communities. And tremendous success in a lot of projects. There also was a, a very important paper just out in the British Medical Journal this year a randomized trial in 179 G general practices in the UK where they took very seriously chronically ill people, put the kind of thing Peter was talking about in their homes with nurse visiting. They have a 15% reduction in hospital and ED use and a 45% decline in mortality in the first year. What's interesting as you guys are talking is that every one of you has outcomes measures in your brain. No more is this like, oh, well, it feels good or I think it can work. These are measurable changes that improve quality of life, decrease hospitalizations, decrease morbidity, and allow people to, to, to age in place. Increase joy. So let me ask you an increased joy. Um, so for those who say, yeah, but you know what, I don't need Big Brother in my home. How do we, and Mike, I'm going to put the insurance industry right on the hot seat because no one likes you guys. We need you. I, so I like me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so how do we learn to like you and trust you with our information? <laughs> well, uh, we like let's, you. Let's, first, let's start with the fact that we do have an awful lot of data. And we do an all, an all, a lot about people. And we're in an interesting spot to really be helpful and useful because, uh, first of all, we're properly incentivized to do all of those things. Given be, our, and be, you're given, properly incentivized because... Because you're given a premium and therefore you, you want the most the best outcome you can get for that. And so you're going to look for the best productivity, the best possible services, the highest quality, the best price, value for money, all those things. They're all there. It just so happens that it aligns perfectly with the needs of people, too. And so we're in a great spot to do that. We have uh, wonderful data uh, resources. They're beginning to be used better uh, to help. I'll give you another example where, you know, this is where our industry will change its image, frankly, over time. Uh, we tumble, this whole, whole concept of big data, we tumble a huge uh, database every single day. And from that, we find gaps in care across the entire 
um, system. And I can tell you, in one month this year, we found one month we found 400,000 gaps in care, based on what we th think knew should be happening with these patients, or at least the data told us it wasn't happening. 800,000 messages went out, and we had like a 35 percent conversion rate on those messages. That's an improvement in quality. It's helpful. It's useful. And to the extent that over time people see that coming from our industry, I think some of this will change over time because we're in a great spot to help. Calvin, how about you? How's, what's Tenet doing? Yeah, well, building on what uh, Mike just said, so we have the luxury of treating almost 8 million patients a year, and that gives us a lot of data as well. And we've been focused for years on care variability. And so looking at areas where we have clarity around what should be done based upon external or internal evidence, and then looking to see how we could move closer to that being done on a more consistent basis. And so we're continuing to do that while also looking for ways to drive down cost. Um, there is, we agree, some degree of waste that exists in the system and looking for ways to improve the quality while also uh, reducing the cost of care. Um, we've been working on preventable readmissions since uh, the end of 2009, really the beginning of 2010. And, and data to show that it's working? Yes, we do. And so our, our commitment uh, has been that for those patients who require hospitalization, of course, we want you to come to us. We are going to deliver care that is, you know, is consistent and scientifically sound while you're there, and we'll continue to move in that direction. But then we've also put transition coordinators in some of our hospitals. We are working with partners around predictive software to look at those patients who might be more likely to return either for health reasons or social reasons, and then working with partners on the post-acute care and discharge space to actually work with them in, in their homes, in their communities, to actually address those gaps so they don't return if uh, that admission could have been uh, prevented or avoided. Sue, so when you look at what, has, what the, the property in the portfolio that General Electric owns, from dishwashers to turbines to jet engines to, frankly now, interesting, very interesting stuff in the healthcare space. Is there a way to make the American home a smart home so that an elderly person, a young person, a doctor, the family, the hospital become an integrated f force? You bet. And, and <laughs> you know, I smile because a couple of things before I completely address that. First of all, on the whole notion of privacy, and I'll bring it back to your question in a second, privacy more and more is becoming a currency, right? But don't Data's you think privacy is an illusion? It, well, I mean, this seriously, should we sort of get over it? Yeah, this is what I'm going to get at. I mean, at, by the time is... you post your GYN <laughs> results on Facebook, isn't it over? Well, we just, <laughs> yeah, and we just had the president actually say he's willing to get his genome sequenced. Now, come on. 13 years ago, this is pre-GINA and whatnot, the Genetic Information on Discrimination Act, people, the whole notion of getting your genome sequenced was just, oh my goodness, we had to have the protections in place to actually allow for people to get comfortable. And I think the same thing is going to happen with data. The more and more we educate consumers ourselves that in fact using data that is simply presented to you in a way that you can interface, I suspect that will really empower us to make decisions on our own. Bringing that back to what GE brings to the table as, as it relates to portfolio and really looking at this. First of all, we have a um, joint venture with Intel, which is in fact all about care innovations in the home, and that is to have remote patient monitoring and being able to actually continue to make sure that the person who is aging in situ can actually be monitored in a way that is much more cost effective, much more efficient to the system. You start to think about everything that GE has in its portfolio. You can imagine the dispenser in your refrigerator knowing exactly what it should be dispensing based on holistic things that has been measured on you based on sensors and everything else that next morning. So it can get dispensed automatically for you. Everything will be tied in over time. And that, y you think about that and people say, no, it can't be true, but it's, it's coming and a lot of it's here already, actually. If you look at the cover of Wired Magazine this past issue and the cover of Fortune, it's all about robots and science and what's not coming, it's sort of here waiting for integration. We have a question over here. If you would please stand up and s say your name. Hey. Hello. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mark Kasten. Um, question to the hospital and the insurance company. Do you guys share data specifically? And if you do, how? And how does one affect the other? If not, why not? And how could that be a model to everybody else? Good question. 
how do we share data? And frankly, in the, at, at the time when electronic well, medical records I'll, aren't necessarily a home yeah, run. I'll start. Um, I would argue that eventually electronic records are going to be a home run. If oh, the, I still the think they are today. The implementation is hard, yeah, exactly. and it slows people down in the beginning, but eventually it's the right thing. Um, and the technology is getting better. I would say that there's, I know our industry is doing it. There's a huge investment going on right now in terms of, of wiring the system. Uh, I think there was uh, some money in the stimulus bill to help push the ball down the field, which was which was useful, I think. Um, and so that's getting better and better. I mean, we, we have all sorts of mobility capabilities today where not only individuals but providers and others can get in real-time information. It, it's, it's crucial to the long-term solution that you have real-time, actionable information for all the participants. The only way you get that is by wiring it all. And so the money's going in there. It's getting better. There's a lot of venture capital money in this space. And so I think this will, t this will uh, eventually emerge uh, and, and be ubiquitous. But right now, we're still struggling to kind of get it moving. And I think you're going to continue to see a lot of e effort and a lot of money spent on it. It raises the question, should hospitals and insurance companies make each other's data available? What's the, I can see the downside. What's the upside? So, um, Kevin and then Don. Yeah, so uh, first we are, we're also um, putting out an electronic health record and we're implementing that across our system. And that's the first thing is building your own internal infrastructure. So that's the first thing. And then secondly, yeah, there should be some sharing of data. There should be sharing of information that actually helps us to be more aware of what's going on with the patient prior to them coming into the care, how they're being managed while they're there, and then also what's happening to them after they leave, especially since there's this increasing accountability that's being assigned to us both by uh, governmental payers as well as commercial payers. Also, by having that information, it's, um, it's more complete and allows us to make decisions that would be in the best interest of the patient as well. So we have to figure out ways to open that. The way that we do it today, quite honestly, is a, a little bit archaic. We rely heavily on people. Um, you have case management who are kind of working across the other boundaries to share that information. We have those in people, people internally as well. Um, but we will get to a place where we're using an electronic platform so that it's more real time and it's more accurate and it's more actionable. So Don, what, is the, what does perfect look like if with insurance companies and hospitals sharing a patient's data? And then what does the individual person need to, uh, need to know to access that? Um. Let's first talk about how important this is. You, cannot, you can't get better at golf if you don't know where the golf ball went. We can't get better at healthcare unless we know how we're doing. So we've got to do that. To do that, we have to pool the information because something could happen in this hospital and we don't realize something else happened in another one to the same patient. If we don't get the data together, we can't all learn what's going on. This is about learning, by the way, not about, not about punishment or rewards or anything. It's just about learning. Patients should have access to everything about them. The book is theirs, not ours, and I think that that's a very important principle in this. But we, we've got to, we're on an expedition to learn how to be mature and trustworthy about this. But I always remember, I, a quick thing, when I was in practice in pediatrics, I, I was lucky to work in a place that had the first, one of the first electronic records. And one day on my desk, I got this report on my use of x-rays. I was using x-rays eight times more often than my chief, and she was a better pediatrician than me. So I went over to her office and I said, what, what, what's going on? And I, I was just wrong. I had mislearned a whole bunch of stuff. If I hadn't had the data, I couldn't improve. And that's what we're headed for here, that kind of ability to study how we do. Peter? You know, uh, 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 10 or so years ago, I was part of a committee uh, called the PTAC, the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee. And I'll generalize here, but basically uh, that committee said that uh, if only we could share medical information in a reasonable way. And by the way, almost none of that. The answer to your question is no. Almost no sharing actually happens. It's, uh, it's really, really poor. It's nothing close to what happens in finance. If I were to summarize and paraphrase the results of that, we basically said if we could only get the health information technology in healthcare to be similar to where it is in banking, just, just similar, only three things would happen. One, everybody would be dramatically healthier. Two, we'd save billions and billions and tens of billions of dollars. And three, we'd invent an entirely new kind of science. But other than that, it's probably, probably not worth doing. <laughs> <laughs> Lately, the Institute of Medicine came out uh, just a few months ago and, and quantified that at $700 billion of savings that's available if we can only leverage the kinds of information that we already have 
in meaningful ways. So there's a tremendous amount. And on your privacy issue, I think that you know, Verizon's looking to embrace the privacy thing. Let's give people choice and give us the tools that allow us to give those people that choice. For those people who are worried about privacy, let them turn things off. Let them know who's looked at their records. Let them uh, uh, decrease uh, some of that uh, sharing where it's appropriate. And at the same time, for people who post their gynecological information on Facebook or whatever your quote was, you know, that whole generation may be more open to, to that. But I don't think you need to, to tell people to give up on privacy to achieve great sharing. So if we talk about data being the, the, the threshold now of making things better and taking that big leap forward, and we can talk about what that means with regard to privacy, and I'm sure we all define it somewhat differently. How do we either ding people for poor behavior, cigarette smoking, poor food, lack of exercise, or how do we inversely reward them if they're doing well? And Michael, what role should the insurance company play in incentivizing people? Well, we do have some regulatory restraints on, on these sort of things, but it's, it's emerging and getting better in, in terms of, I think, I think whacking people is probably the wrong direction. I think we're better off incentivizing them. Uh, that's the whole concept of the thing I talked about earlier with Humana Vitality. It's uh, essentially a behavioral modification tool that is, that's ubiquitous in the rest of the economy, and we just need and to bring those kind of things into behavioral modification that has a monetary component? Yes, that's part of it. Uh, some of it's just having people have, understand their health better, understanding what they need to do, but finding ways to get people to change their behavior and have it be sustainable. I mean, we, we, the weight loss programs are all over, and they all tend to work, but they, people tend to revert back the minute you stop them, so you're not getting a permanent change. So the, I think the real key is finding sustainable behavior change and using any number of techniques and tools to do that. And I think incentives and rewards as a platform is actually one of them because we all, we all are motivi motivated by that, whether we want to admit it or not. Sue? Yeah, I, I was just uh, smiling and thinking about what, in fact, has really motivated the culture of health that GE now is embracing. And it really has to do on a number of things, and that is it's not just data driven. It's really if you're going to incent a certain behavior, you also have to provide the tool sets. You also have to provide, and we all know this, health is local, right? You mentioned Weight Watchers. Why is it that Weight Watchers has worked so well? One, it's local. Your social environment around you is, it is social. So you've got local and social, and the metrics are pretty defined. So as, as we think about this whole notion of data and being able to take that in and empowering everything, at the bottom of all that is this whole notion of consumerism and how it's really taking over healthcare. We are no longer the passive patients. We all know this. We actually want to know <laughs> what's going on and help us understand which choices and which decisions we can make. It's not just about the data. It's how it's presented, how it's actionable, like you said, and how we can do something about it with tool sets that are accessible to us. I think it's interesting you say that because for the number of physicians who are up here right now, doctors are the, have find change the toughest. And I think, I think physicians find change the toughest. And speaking on behalf of those of us up here, consumers, when consumers believe that they have some chit in the game and they have a voice, Physicians may be taken and kicking and screaming, but change is on the way. Well, one of the things that um, Don mentioned, which is very helpful, is recognizing, using that data to recognize there are differences in the way that you're practicing compared to your peers. And the more that we expose that and the more that patients become engaged in that and set the expectations, the more that, uh, you know, I think that physicians will embrace uh, the level of change that's necessary. It's going to be gradual, but that will actually help to move it forward. We have a question out here. Would you please stand and say your name? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Mark Weissman, and when on my nighttime job is making sure Carter here does his homework and cleans his room once a month. But I think you've done a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> during, during the day, I'm a primary care physician, and I care for my patients um, both in the hospital and when they go home. And when they get home, I need a physical therapist because they're debilitated. I need a nutritionist. I need... Um, uh, an assessment of, of their well-being, what's going on in their home. And pretty soon it sounds like I'm going to have every weight, every blood pressure, every meal that they've eaten coming to me. The amount of data that comes to the primary care physician is overwhelming. And yet the primary care physician is still practicing as a little silo. Team-based care does not exist in, as, a, as a rule. So I'm curious from the panel standpoint, 
you're going to be taking the physician kicking and screaming into this because they don't want to give up control, but we're overwhelmed with the amount of data, the pages of stuff that come from each of our colleagues bringing us stuff from the home. How do we handle this amount of data? How do you move the physician community forward? And I, I think probably, you know, it's the model that you and I know about practicing medicine so antiquated that, you know, it, it's not unsus unsustainable the way you and I look at medicine. Yes, and Don, go ahead, and then Peter. Teams matter. Uh, what you said about we don't have them now is right, but we can get there. And learning how that we all now practice an interdependency. I'm no longer the hero that, can, that saves the day, but I'm interdependent with others to give care. That's what works, and we know, we know that. On the data side, we're going to have to be smarter than we are right now. We're through an almost festival period of data now. An average hospital in this country, I believe, now has to report about 1,500 variables to somebody. It's just crazy making. And so as we enter the next phase, we, hopefully we can narrow down on the, on the measurements that matter, the data that we really want, and make your job a lot easier in doing the right thing for the patient. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, whole, the whole history of technology is that at first it's overwhelming and later it's simplifying. And uh, it's that later stage that we don't have clear visibility to, <laughs> right? But it's the iPhone simplification. There's more power on your hip or in your pocket now than put the, the Apollo astronauts on the moon. Uh, and it isn't because we have a bajillion numbers flying around. It's because we have a very simple interface and a screen with it. So at Verizon, among other things, we've got a platform we call the mHealth platform. The whole point of it is to simplify for all the innovators out there the hard parts of solving the physician's question. If you have a thousand diabetics and they get their glucose four times a day, I'm pretty sure, although we can do it, that you don't want 4,000 glucose readings a day coming to your desk. Instead, you want them to go in a secure way to a cloud where a decision and triggers are made based on their particular condition and their particular combination of conditions that maybe you help tweak and set that maybe with their, uh, maybe with some uh, input from the patient themselves, so that, that you wind up with the alert. Maybe you don't even want that. Maybe the alert goes to the sister and the daughter and the neighbor down the street that says, you know, something's wrong with Betty. Could you stop by? Her diabetes seems to be out of control. It's not that we want physicians more in the loop. We want physicians to do the part that we're really good at and get us out of the stuff that we're really bad at. And you know, physicians fundamentally have been consultants for 70 or 80% of what we do. Consultancy is mostly uh, becomes a service over time. A question, we, we have a question here in the first row yes. also. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Darrell Adams. I'm the superintendent for the Coachella Valley Unified School District. And I thank you all for being here in the Eastern uh, Coachella Valley. Although we are further east, that's where the real work is. I represent some of the poorest of the poor in our nation. 97% Hispanic, 90% of our students are on free and reduced lunch. We have an obesity problem in our district. But what we've done is taken some individual responsibility and we passed a bond to purchase 18,000 iPads for our 18,000 students. So when you talk about data, it comes down to education with that data and how we can use it to help change lives and change uh, eating habits and nutrition education. So I'm proud to be here today with you, but I want to know how you as healthcare providers and insurance uh, companies can work with us. I have 18,000 students ready. They're, they're going to have, a, each one will have an iPad from preschool through high school. How are we going to use that data? How are we going to get the information out to them? How are we going to educate them? I want to partner with you. Could you help us? So this is the general, generational shift away from aging in place and elderly to the future, the, face, the future face of America and partnering with young people and data. And frankly, what are we going to do now to teach health and wellness to a generation um, that until recently was almost going to be skipped over. Kelvin? Well, um, one of the things that we're doing at Tenet is we have a, um, a hospital, St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, which is in Philadelphia. And um, we are establishing something there that gets to some of the things that you're mentioning. Uh, the center will be called the Center for the Urban Child. And what that focuses on are some of the other determinants of health and wellness and actually bringing people together through a collaborative partnership to both become aware of it, to educate others, and then to be able to address the specific circumstances and situations that will help them to live healthier and more productive lives. And are you optimistic that it's doable? And how would you partner with kids like this who are impoverished but wired? Yeah. 
Um, so, yes, we are um, very optimistic uh, about what it will become and what it will be able to produce. And in terms of connecting with the Wired, I think that's a, another opportunity for us. So, um, to be able to have things that are um, communicating how you're doing or what the goal should be and how you're performing against that and to create dialogue and community around that is going to be essential as we move forward. Don, how do you harness kids like this? Um, each kid needs to know they're not alone. One of the great opportunities you have now is for a child to be able to say, I have this problem, who else has it, and what, are you, what have you done? These communities of shared effort can do things that no individual separately can do. And by the way, I'm thrilled to hear a school system getting involved here. Health is not going to be solved in health care. That's what we're telling you. And to have the school system mobilized, I'll tell you, I think you can really crack this. We have a question here in the front row, if we could get it. Hi, it's Rose Kirk, and I appreciate the discussion that I'm hearing in terms of how you integrate technology companies with, um, you know, health companies and bring solutions into play, particularly when you think about chronic disease in our country. But one thing that's missing for me is a discussion about the role of pharmaceuticals, and particularly the, the relationship between pharmaceuticals and the physicians. And how do you reconcile some of that when we are a country where disease management is too often about appeal? not about managing your health. And I would love your perspectives on how you are engaging with that. And if I could take that one step forward and tell me if I'm wrong, because I wanted to make the switch to preventive health. And preventive health in this country gets a short shrift. We're accustomed to going in and getting fixed. So how do we harness the data we talked about, engage students, and yet get away from this idea that the doctor is a hero because he or she made me better, when the whole idea is to avoid becoming ill to begin with? And, I mean, look, we're, we're in the midst of a flu epidemic. We can't get people to get their flu shots. So talk about preventive health. Don, I'll start with you, then, then go down the um, line. Balance matters here. Um, Bellingham, Washington did a tremendous work on chronic disease care, lowering, they did it with nurse coordinators, and hospital use went down, emergency department use went down, function went up, and pharmaceutical use went up because when people take the right medicine at the right time, things can get better. So there's a baby in the bathwater. You're absolutely right. Depending on pharmacy and depending on especially bells and whistles drugs that make no difference, it's, we've got to unlearn that and get away from that. But there's, there's a proper balance here. When people do take responsibility for their health, when they engage in the kinds of activities that we're talking about here, you will watch pharmaceutical use also decline because they'll be less dependent on things to keep their cholesterol down or their blood pressure under control. Michael? But we don't always want it to decline. We, we don't always want to. Drug use to, to decline at all because we have, you know, most people over 65 have chronic illnesses. Most of those things are treated with some form of a medication. And compliance is a big deal in terms of keeping their overall health status high. The and right so medication it's a, it's, for the it's, right. It's the right thing at the right time and make sure they're compliant. Uh, and it's another place where we've been, some, we've been actually quite useful to folks because we actually know all the drugs somebody's buying. We don't know if they're swallowing them, but we know that they're buying them. And many times these seniors are seeing multiple doctors, they're bouncing in and out of hospitals and clinics and all sorts of things are going on. And, and I don't know about your parents, but I can predict a few things. If you go to their home, they have a pile of pills and they're always in the kitchen, interestingly, not in the bathroom. Um, they keep them there for whatever reason. Uh, and they're all taking five or six different things. And one of the things, because we have that holistic view of the individual, we can have some clue as to whether these things actually work together or not. From a school perspective, you need to seek me out later. We have uh, some interesting things that can be done on iPads relative at, to websites and motivation. At the end of this session, come on back. Yeah, we, we, okay. we, 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 we have something. Come over to this side. Peter. You know, all of this requires innovation. Uh, you're, you know, we're here because we're trying to drive innovation. We have ideas of what those answers may be, but, if, but everyone who's a doctor and a scientist knows that whatever might be the ironclad rule that this thing surely cures cancer in the test tube, one in a hundred of those ever make it to, to, uh, to, the, to the real world actually working. So we need innovation in two big areas. One is in, 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 foster, in getting people to, to, to answer the questions. You need to tell people what you want them to innovate around, and your question was the exact question, right? We need innovation. Now that we got iPads for kids in schools, how are we going to use them to make things better? Last week, Verizon announced a $10 million uh, uh, challenge. Uh, and we're hoping other people will do similar things for the explicit purpose of coming up with answers to questions exactly like that so that we can figure that out. Separately, we're trying to do things like partner with, uh, we partner with Duke 
to do the science around information technology. We've got a lot of science around pharmacology and a lot of science around medical procedures, but we don't have a lot of science. I mean, there is almost no science in computer science, oddly enough. <laughs> we don't do any hypothesis or experiment. People just build an app and assume it works. We're pretty sure that that doesn't work, just like most pills don't work, <laughs> right? So we want to foster the science of what works and trying to figure out how to drive those things. And, and these are the kind of things that we'd love to work on. We are working with, with uh, Coachella Valley. That's one of the big reasons we're, we're, we're moving the project we are, we are with the Clinton Foundation, to drive these answers. Could I get a microphone down to the first row first, then I'll come back here. I want Chelsea, would you stand? I'd be happy to stand. Um, Nancy, this is a question for you as well as for the panel. How do you think that medical school education, nursing school education, um, pharmacists, pedagogy should change so that the next generation doesn't grow up with the same practice constraints that clearly many of you have, many of the questioners have? And how do not only those pedagogies change, but kind of the support of computer science and engineering and educational pedagogies change so that our next generation of teachers and doctors and innovators are thinking more holistically? Well, I'll, I'll tackle it first and see you know, what everybody thinks. I, I think it requires a systematic change. And one of the most interesting things happening right now is going on at Stanford in the School of, of Global Health. And um, a woman there, Dr. Michelle Berry, who is an infectious disease person from Yale, came out and created something de novo. And she decided in order to create a de novo project, she wanted to hear from architects. She wanted to hear from systems analysts. She wanted to hear from legal. She had IT guys spend time in the ER. She had ER docs spend time you know, out in the community. Because when you take people out of their own ecosystems, they see the fallacies of what other people are doing. And then she brought them together. And I thought in that moment, I thought there lies, therein lies the new medical school. We now know we have over 50% of women. I happen to think that will make a difference. But this idea of sharing information and the patient has a right to his or her own data is going to be the paradigm shift for what the doctor-patient relationship looks like. Now, I'm just old enough to still believe that the doctor-patient relationship is sacrosanct. What someone says to you is confidential and does not go home, does not go to a cocktail party, does not go into a systems in, that can be read unless somebody wants it. But I also believe that prominent people have to have their human genome done and put it out there in public. And I'm one of those people who's going to do that this year. So on some level, we have to share data. In other ways, we have to protect the individual. And then we have to say to the patient, the consumer, this is your life, this is your show, and you have to drive this baby, and I'm your partner in doing so. And that, to me, is the great doctor-patient relationship. And I think that's the doctor of the future with all the data and computer stuff around it. One of the things we also have to address is really creating a, a, te a team-based construct. So um, <clears throat> it, I still find it interesting that what we do typically in medical education and clinical education is you're educated in your school, in your silo, around your particular doctrine. And then at some point you come into a healthcare environment and one of the challenges that we continue to confront is how do we work together as a team so that we can tackle this problem together? And so the more that we can get this, this team-based philosophy during your education and your training, the better equipped people will be to say, what are we actually trying to accomplish here? We're focusing on health, we're focusing on, on sickness, and then how do we bring our different skills to that? How do we communicate and how do we work together constructively to address it? We'll take this one right down the line. There's a lot of changes. Teams are important. One fundamental change is to reposition patients and families in the educational system. If you want to change the way people think, have the patient be the teacher, the family be the teacher, sit down, be quiet, and listen. I think the young people need to understand how immensely valuable and, and, and important that is. There are new skills, the technological skills and the prevention skills. You know, the CDC had a report this year. There's a drug that cuts breast cancer risk by a third. It reduces diabetes by nearly 50% risks. It, um, it cuts depression. It's the better than, than most depression pills. It's walking 30 minutes a day, four days a week. Uh, I wasn't trained on that in medicine, but boy, I'll tell you, it's something I think we ought to put right, in the, right on the screen for young people. Yeah, I, I agree. I worry we're training the wrong kind of doctors. You uh, know what's interesting you should say that? 
I have the same concern. I'm on faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. I could no more get into medical school today than fly. And I see young kids come in who, frankly, I don't want them to be my doctors, but they're cuckoo smart. I have the same concern. <laughs> I think the screening for young physicians is upside down. What do you really think, Nancy? I know. <laughs> it, but it, it's not only that. It's, it's the specialties they're going into. And, you know, it, it, there's some simple math out there. The baby boom generation has the potential to overwhelm this system. Um, and what kind of doctors are they going to need? If we believe in integrated health care and we believe in primary care physicians being the captain of the ship, and we do, and we know integrated health care is the best and, and the highest quality, but then, you know, you have to ask yourself, and if you think about things like radiology, for example, where you've got incredible capabilities. I talked about productivity earlier through the digitization of, of these pictures uh, and the ability of, of someone sitting in one place and being highly productive in multiple locations, and you start thinking about all of that. Then you go look at what's coming out of medical schools and you realize that the alignment is not real good in terms of what the demand is going to be for the captains of the ship. That's what bothers me the most. I'm not one of those, however, that is convinced we have the big doctor shortage everybody talks about. If you just look, take a snapshot of today's world and move forward, yes, we I think do. We have an allocation issue. But if issue. you change things, you may not have that shortage because of the productivity that's possible. Sue. You know, this is a systematic change, and I, I think this was alluded to already. And in the Institute of Medicine, when you take a look at what they're trying to do in terms of changing the taxonomy, first and foremost, the foundation has to be laid in place. The same, when you, when you say something in one discipline in medicine and you say something in another, they they need to be defined. And they're, they're trying to do this through the digitization of data, and they talk about much more precision medicine. That's not in the textbooks yet. It's so new because of this data revolution, but it's got to get into the textbooks over time. When you think about it before, it used to be there was breast cancer, and there was lung cancer, and there was liver cancer, and we all believed it was only based on organs. It was organized because of the way we do surgery, right? It sort of makes sense. But yet, when you think about the disease per se, it's probably based on genetic factors, right? And it's molecular, at the molecular level. That is sort of the first element that has to be put in place for the education system. Not only, to, we don't have to have doctors become computer scientists, but I think the whole notion of this convergence of data, the digitization of data, the quantification of data, and then how it relates to outcomes has to be something that's better understood. But I, I, I also have to agree, and you mentioned it, both Nancy and Don, which is, first and foremost, you have to have the doctor listen. And, the, and, and that relationship still has to remain. They, I hope that never changes in terms of education. And I'm afraid that's still a learned skill. Peter, I want to shift gears for a second because we have a Twitter um, question from Dolly Parikh, which I think is really cuts through a lot of what we're talking, and that is, can we cut down time in clinical trials? $2 billion to get a drug from the lab to market. Um, FDA requiring a lot of drugs and manufacturers to go through a lot of hoops. The question is, are we, is the way we construct trials wrong given today's immediacy? And uh, the FDA is involved in all the electronic things that we're talking about too. And uh, you know, so the proper role of trials is a real big question, especially when you get to precision medicine. You know, if everybody gets a precision uh, cocktail or medicine that's particular to their particular disease, we're going to need 200 new drugs a year, not 10 or, or so, right? Uh, and so we need to be able to up the pace of the creation of, of medication and up the pace of the creation of devices that do the things that might uh, be able to do. If I go to, I wanted to restate your question. I think you're asking if we're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> when it comes to medical education. And I think the answer of that boils down to, yes, we're teaching people how to save lives rather than how to, how to protect lives, how to en enable wellness. We certainly need both, but we're sort of 99-1 on the save life hero sort of mode now for healthcare training. And we need to get a, a big priority of that moving in the, in the other direction. I want to go for a second to President Clinton. I, first of all, I, this is, uh, I want to make a one sentence statement and then ask the question. I think that we're going to be compelled to consider whether the FDA has the capacity to properly examine and approve in a timely fashion all the drugs and all the medical devices. And I think that they're being forced to choose and they're in an environment where they don't get in trouble if they say no. And at some point, we all want that. We don't want them to give us bad devices or bad drugs. 
but I think there's a lot of evidence, particularly on the device side, we've been so slow that first it's kind of hurt the American economy and secondly, it's undermining the ability of people to maximize a variety of devices for healthcare. So you can comment on that if you want. Here's my, I have a mundane question. You've talked a lot about management of data in a very sophisticated way. Pennsylvania is one of the few states in the country that requires hospitals to report both what they charge for various procedures and the results they get. The results tend to be better at least for surgical procedures as they do more. The ones that do more do better. Not surprising. The prices have nothing to do with the results. Could be because the cost of care in rural areas are higher than urban areas. Could be a lot of reasons. But do you believe that every state or the nation should have a reporting system both that measures prices and results and that would enable us to dig down and figure out how to improve quality and reduce cost. And where should those be posted when a patient comes in for his or her gallbladder? Let me just ask, that was the mundane question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness. Yeah, I mean the transparency of what people are paying for and what they're getting. It goes to the core of waste, medical errors, which Don has been has spent a good chunk of his life addressing. And the fact that if we do talk about patients being in the driver's seat, you don't go to get your car checked without knowing what a carburetor is gonna cost. So we have it all turned upside down. Yeah, I think transparency sets you free always, frankly. Um, and uh, we do know that when consumers slash patients uh, actually have actionable information, they actually make great choices. Uh, and the evidence we have is, uh, I'll use a drug example. You take these seniors that are in these private Medicare programs, they have a drug benefit associated with that. And the minute they got transparency, and they get it every single month, they, here's all the drugs you take, here's what they cost, here's what we paid, here's your choices, uh, ask your doctor about this. When they know that, they are incredible buyers and seekers of value. Uh, and the broader we get that concept laid into the system, the more powerful it's going to be. So it's one of the things we wake up every day trying to do. How do we get more transparency around what we do, about what hospitals do? And uh, I think, you know, I th it's very, very powerful. Yeah, so who? State law everywhere, should there be a federal requirement? And our hospital man hasn't said what he thinks. <laughs> Come on, Kelvin. Well, I'll, let, I'll let him take Mike, that. Do you wanna, well, I'm no, happy this year. So um, one of our core values is transparency, and we've advocated that on multiple levels. Um, but that's necessary at the institutional level. We talked about doctors and knowing what they're doing and how that compares. It's necessary outside of that. Um, and so we've advocated for that information to be made available. The, the question when you get to the charges component and the cost is making sure that it's an actual reflection of what those charges and costs are. And so th that's where it becomes a, a bit of work that needs to be done, but around overall outcomes and how people are performing, we've advocated for that and continue to do so. so address the, for a second the urban versus rural situation and why would cost differ so much in various places, um, locales in Pennsylvania and are you holding physicians and those hospitals um, to the data they're producing? Are you penalizing the hospitals that aren't doing as well? For us? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. One of the things that you hear is that technology is driving that. It may be the availability of services. It may be the involvement of consultants who are in that care as well. So there are a lot of factors that can influence the, the cost of care. In terms of overall accountability, yes. So. We actually have the internal data, again, going to what we have, and we look at that to see how we're doing in comparison to what our targets are, um, how we're doing relative to comparable hospitals within the portfolio, and we work on that internally. When you, when you move beyond that, and we have hospitals in Pennsylvania, there's an opportunity to do that, but again, it has to be done right under the right circumstances uh, with the right data that's adjusted in such a way that it really is comparing apples to apples. So and and, and I have to say, who does this? I think large self-insured employers can really help in this particular situation. GE, for example, through our Health Ahead program, has put cost calculators into place for use across our employee base. We have 300,000 employees today. It allows you to take a look when you're making a decision about where you wanna go for your medical care to actually understand it. Sometimes you can't get it as easily, but our group has actually dug in and tried to make all of those prices transparent so that we understand our costs 
and clearly you're going to make a choice as a consumer as which is more affordable. And am, am I correct that in the GE system, if I look, if I'm going to have um, cardiac surgery, I can see which hospital has better outcomes, how much it's going to cost me out of pocket, and I can make those decisions accordingly. Yes, and we're yeah. doing it hospital by hospital and, num and which, different numbers of which hospitals. Which is a so. smart move. Don? I want to emphasize the importance of all payer data. The, 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 the next step we should take, President Clinton, I think, is towards state databases which in which all payers contribute, even if they're scared to right now. I think it has to have price and cost information in it. And it has to have the outcome data, and that's a, that's a challenge because we could trivialize this and just study little things that don't matter, or we can get really smart about what does matter to people and measure that. But all payer databases at the state level with price and outcome would be transformative. There's, there's been some movement on it. We uh, A number of the big payers, I think there's five of us involved, have begun to put our data together uh, into an individual ind independent party so that we're not seeing into each other's business. And so once you get it into an independent place, then you've got the effectiveness of the database and, and, and you don't have any business issues that go with it. So there's, there's some progress. I, but I, I agree with Dr. Baggett. You want to make sure you're campaign, uh, comparing apples to apples. There may be other non, you know, money-motivated explanations for why Hospital X gets better results and charges less than Hospital Y for Procedure Z. I agree with that. But... Should, how can we speed it up? There's a, Pennsylvania is one of only a handful of places that requires this to be done for everybody. And only so many people can work for GE. Okay. What should we do to accelerate this? Yeah, and I, Peter. I, I think that, that the main thing government can do in that space is try and find some laser kind of uh, regulatory assistance that, makes, that liberates people to figure out this data and publish it. I'm not saying private data, but it's, it's uh, for example, um, um, even aggregated uh, data is often difficult to legally publish. But you know, uh, the president's right. I mean, so if Pennsylvania is doing this, but working yep. in a state by state by state issue, we're sticking with one more patchwork quilt of right. data that doesn't interconnect, right. doesn't move things forward. Does it take a bunch of very brave governors to say this is what we're going to do and you ram it down uh, legislature's throats because if we can't rely on the federal government to do it and you're right not everyone can work for GE there has to be a way to move big data small data and transparency at the same time it's a little wonky but um, we're uh, my as my kids would say we're one fry short of a happy meal here we're almost there <laughs> there is a uh, there's That's a provision in the, in the new law, it's section 10332, if anyone cares. It's the, it's, the, it's the qualified entity provision. There is now authority for in, at in some level of aggregation to set up a so-called qualified entity that's the independent party Mike's talking about that can take the data. What we need is Congress to mandate that Medicaid share its data instead of withholding it. We need Medicaid to follow through on that, and we really need courage on the part of the private insurers and the hospitals to say, let's leap over our shadows on this one. If we get the data together, yeah, it's a little scary, but we're going to learn a lot. And on that note, I'd like to thank all of you, Peter, Sue, Michael, Don, and Kelvin. President Clinton, thank you very much. And thanks, all everyone. Have a great break. We'll see you in a few minutes.